Dr. Holly Gilmer, MD, is a board-certified neurosurgeon specializing in a number of complex conditions. She attended Harvard University and the University of Michigan Medical School and went on to complete her neurosurgery residency training at the University of California Davis Medical Center. After her residency, she completed a specialty fellowship training in pediatric neurosurgery at Children's Hospital of Michigan and a second fellowship in peripheral nerve surgery at the Louisiana State University Medical Center. She went to school for many, many years. <laughs> Dr. Gilmer is an associate professor of neurosurgery at Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine, and we are privileged to have at least one medical student here in the audience today. Thank you so much for coming. Um, through which OUWB, Dr. Gilmer is actively involved in teaching medical students and neurosurgery residents. In addition to her academic participation, Dr. Gilmer is also Chief of Pediatric Neurosurgery at Beaumont Health System and Medical Director of the Beaumont Chiari Program. Dr. Gilmer's clinical activities include specialized interests in pediatrics, Chiari malformation and syringomyelia, hydrocephalus, neuro-oncology, peripheral nerve surgery, including brachial plexus injury, and craniofacial reconstruction. Professionally, Dr. Gilmer is an active participant in the American Society for Pediatric Neurosurgery, the Peripheral Nerve Task Force of the AANS CNS, and she is on the board of AANS now, the American Association of Neurological Surgeons, Hydrocephalus Association, the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, and Women in Neurosurgery, among others. Personally, many of us have the honor of knowing Dr. Gilmer as a compassionate and wonderfully listening doctor, and it is an honor to be able to introduce her. Thank you so much for doing this lecture, Dr. Gilmer. Thank you, Sonia. And thank you, Kathy, for inviting me to speak today at your regional meeting. I'm going to talk about a topic that is pretty dear to my heart, uh, Chiari malformations. Okay. So Chiari first um, appeared in the literature in 1883. Uh, John Cleland described a Chiari, which was actually a Chiari II malformation, the type that's associated with spina bifida. Subsequently, Hans Chiari, an Austrian pathologist, described three cases of Chiari uh, malformation um, actually three types of Chiari malformation uh, between 1891 and 1896. Now there's, there are four types altogether that we know of. Chiari 1, 2, 3, and 4. They have nothing to do with each other. They were just all described by Chiari. So Chiari 1 was the first one he described and so on. It's not degrees of severity. They're totally different. But he was interested in pathology in the posterior fossa. Later on in Germany, Schwalbe and Griedig, who were uh, students of Julius Arnold, German pathologist, in 19, uh, 1907 described four more cases and they just really attached their professor's name to it. And that's how we got Arnold Chiari. But later on, you know, we uh, corrected that injustice and now we call them Chiari malformations. Although Arnold Chiari still kind of hangs around in the literature sometimes. So the first surgery for Chiari was done in 1932. About eight surgeries were done. There was 100% mortality. At that time, we didn't have the anesthesia techniques. We didn't have, you know, the antibiotics that we have now. We didn't have the techniques for hemostasis, for stopping bleeding in the OR, and the patients just didn't do well. Um, later, frame and magnum decompression was tried, just opening up the back of the skull, and still wasn't successful. So then Chiari malformation, or surgeries for Chiari malformation fell out of favor until about the 80s um, when it's had a resurgence, but it's still relatively young. When you think about, you know, in the last 20 to 30 years, we've really been doing these surgeries on a regular basis, and that gets to the issues I'll talk about later of raising awareness and educating both medical people as well as the community about Chiari. So Chiari 1 malformations, Chiari 1 and Chiari 2 are the most common. Chiari 1 malformation is associated with uh, posterior fossa hypoplasia or essentially the back of the head forming too small. In patients with spina bifida or myelomeningocele, we know why that happens, and I'll talk about that in a minute. In Chiari 1, we don't know why, but for whatever reason, the back of the head is too small, 
And so as the developing brain is progressing, essentially the cerebellum has nowhere else to go, and it goes down into the top of the spine. It's uh, the bottom of the cerebellum that's involved, which is the cerebellar tonsils. And that's when we uh, get this uh, tonsillar herniation. Chiari 2 malformation is associated with spina bifida. About 90 to 95 percent of kids born with spina bifida, open spina bifida, will have a Chiari malformation. And it's not always symptomatic in them, um, but it's almost always there. And in Chiari 2 malformation, uh, there's more going down into the spine than just the cerebellar tonsils. The um, brainstem is involved, the fourth ventricle is involved, um, the pons is elongated, and the fourth ventricle is also involved. In Chiari 2, if you can visualize, you have the um, the baby with spina bifida with the open spinal defect leaking CSF continuously throughout pregnancy, basically. In some babies more than others, but as that CSF is being lost, there's no buoyancy, which provides the impetus for the skull to expand. So the skull develops too small because of this continuous loss of fluid, and that's what leads to the eventual Chiari malformation. It's also why uh, just as a side note, in the kids who are having the fetal repairs of uh, myelomeningocele, virtually none of them are developing the Chiari. So we can be pretty sure that that's what's the cause of that in those patients. Okay. So the difference between Chiari 1 and Chiari 2, this is a Chiari 1. You see the spinal cord here, brainstem, fourth ventricle, um, all are above the foramen magnum, which is the opening between the skull and the spine. The cerebellar tonsils here are quite long and going down into the spinal canal. This patient with Chiari 2 really has everything going down. The cerebellum, the brain stem, the fourth ventricle is all the way down here. Notice in both of them they have syrinx. They have fluid build up in the spinal cord. So this is um, just an example of what a spina bifida defect or myelomeningocele looks like. This is not blood or anything bloody. This is actually the inside of the spinal cord. And it's open like a tulip, like the petals of a flower. So instead of rolling up the way it should have into a tube, it partially rolled up like this and then fused to the skin around these edges. And then this patient then, this is just a, a Frank Netter drawing, again, of Chiari malformation in which everything is going down into the spine. Chiari 3 malformation and Chiari 4 are rare. Chiari 3 is really the most severe form of Chiari malformation. In this pa these patients, um, the cerebellum uh, is um, abnormal, but also the occipital lobe are all going out of the skull into a low occipital and high cervical defect out into this sort of pouch. This is not compatible with life. A few patients around the world less than 20 have been successfully repaired and lived, but they don't have a normal lifespan. They do have developmental delay. Um, they live about 30, 40 years. And then <coughs> Chiari um, 4 malformation is complete absence of the cerebellum. This is extraordinarily rare. Uh, this is a patient I saw when I was a fellow down at Children's and uh, got a picture of it. Um, as you can see, his occipital lobe here comes all the way down to the bottom of his skull, and there's no cerebellum at all. He was actually normal. A little clumsy, but other than that, normal. Then you've heard of uh, Chiari Zero. Chiari Zero is probably our most recent term. These are patients who have a small posterior fossa, back of the skull is small, and the cerebellum is tight, the falx uh, is, you know, what we call low-lying. Instead of coming out at about this angle, it's coming down like this. And the cerebellar tonsils are, are compressed, and there's no space around the brainstem. But the tonsils don't go down into the spine. These patients can uh, do well with a uh, decompression as well. We don't do as much. We don't open the dura. Uh, we may or may not remove the C1 lamina. But um, a lot of the time their symptoms go away. And interestingly enough, they have all the Chiari symptoms. But then they get the MRI and uh, they don't have the herniation.
Okay. So how does CSF get obstructed in Chiari malformations? This is a normal picture, uh, the cerebellum above the frame and magnum, and the blue is spinal fluid. So these are the ventricles and normal fluid filled spaces in the brain. Uh, the subarachnoid space all containing CSF, fourth ventricle, and then down into the spinal canal as well as outside the spinal cord. In Chiari malformation, the tonsils are here and they really act like a cork in a hole, plugging the flow of fluid between the head and the spine. So pressure builds up within the brain and there's also because, and you notice this is a nice depiction of the low-lying faults that I was talking about as opposed to here in the normal. Uh, there's also constriction of the venous sinuses, which also impairs absorption of CSF. Now the syrinxes occur, we really believe this is a, a hydrocephalus of the brain, of the spinal cord rather. So fluid build up in the spinal cord. The fluid which should be circulating between the head and the spinal cord has nowhere to go. So it actually moves into the substance of the spinal cord, which is able to absorb fluid, kind of like a sponge, not as much as the brain, but to some degree. And then the fluid gets trapped in here in the central canal and causes the syrinx. And it can't just move in and out, so it gets trapped there. Okay. And normally, CSF is absorbed into the subarachnoid spaces, into the um, large venous channels in our brains, which are the sinuses. Um, the superior sagittal sinus, inferior sagittal sinus, transverse sinus, and so on, through the arachnoid villi, and absorbed back into the venous circulation into the blood. Um, CSF is produced in the ventricles by both the chori plexus and the walls of the ventricles. When, when we have this bony stenosis, it impairs the um, dural venous sinuses. A lot of the time, they may even be absent in Chiari patients or, you know, small, and that impairs CSF absorption. So that directly, mechanically, also contributes to the symptoms um, that people have with Chiari. So typical symptoms, most common is headache by far. Um, the headache is typically suboccipital or here in the back of the head and at the upper neck. In my experience, though, it can be anywhere. You know, I have not sent a patient out because the headache wasn't in the right place. Um, the headaches are worsened by valsalva maneuvers or any kind of bearing down, coughing, sneezing, laughing, um, jumping, looking up, extending the neck. If you consider, I'm going to try to go back here. Okay, good. If you consider, this is a neutral position. If somebody's tonsils are here and then they extend the head, where are the tonsils going? They go further down, and that pushes more pressure on the brain stem. If there's a little bit of fluid sort of escaping around the Chiari, then you cut it off. And that's why extending the head uh, worsens the symptoms. Neck pain, back pain, anything below really the neck can be caused by a Chiari malformation. Patients have dizziness, vertigo, problems with hearing, a constant ringing in the ears. Occasionally, patients have ear pain or um, on one side or the other. And then diplopia and photophobia. The diplopia is likely due to the brainstem, compression of the brainstem. Photophobia, or light bothering your eyes, is probably due to buildup of pressure uh, from CSF pressure in the brain. Patients may have weakness in the arms and legs, numbness, tingling, paresthesias, um, the hands are always hot, the hands are always cold. One side is hot, one side is cold. We've seen uh, venous engorgement. Someone, you know, lets their legs dangle and their feet turn purple after a little while. Uh, or one side or the other. And that may be associated with pain. Um, episodic nausea and vomiting. And then chronic fatigue. I'd actually put that up there with headaches. And I think the chronic headaches really cause that. I mean, it's, it's a drain on the body to constantly be uncomfortable and constantly in pain. Sometimes the symptoms are a little different when um, the uh, patient is younger. In babies, we see apnea. In adults, sleep apnea, very common. Um, if an adult is not aware that they have sleep apnea, a lot of the time they just say, I don't sleep well at night, or I wake up all night. And what they're really doing is they're not breathing, and then they sort of wake up gasping for air. 
um, hemodynamic instability, dropping heart rate, uh, hypertension. A lot of the time patients are told they have panic attacks because the heart rate is so variable. In babies, failure to thrive, not eating, they're not swallowing well. Sometimes they can't breathe and swallow at the same time, so they don't gain weight, and then delayed milestones. They don't walk when they should, they don't sit, roll over, and so on. We can see cranial nerve palsies, um, eyes kind of offset, uh, poor coordination. You usually get the history that someone's always been, you know, sort of clumsy, hyperreflexia. Arthrograficosis is a drawing up of the fingers like this. And that's more of an end stage uh, sign. You can see atrophy of the muscles in the hands. You can actually see atrophy of the muscles in the face, too. And that gives the person kind of a flat effect. And so then they are sent to psychiatry for depression. I've seen it. Um, when actually the problem is that their face just doesn't move the way it should. So how do we diagnose Chiari malformation? Well, generally by history. Again, if the patient has spina bifida, then you know um, that they are likely to have Chiari, and you watch for those symptoms. Um, Chiari uh, 1, Chiari 2 occur about at 1 in 1,000 live births. Uh, according to the CSF website, over a million families are living with Chiari syringomyelia or a related disorder. Um, if they're um, in familial cases, it's more like 1 in 10. So if there's a close relative with Chiari, then as some of us have more than a 1 in 10 chance. But in any event, there's a 1 in 10 chance of having a Chiari malformation if you have a close relative with one. So we do physical examination. Um, you know, we find spasticity, hyperreflexia, abnormal eye movements. Um, tongue deviating, tremors when someone sticks out their tongue, all kinds of things. And then we get an MRI. Um, generally at the brain and cervical spine, if we're concerned that there might be a syrinx, then I'll go ahead and get an MRI of the entire spine. Okay. So I'm often asked, can Chiari malformation develop over time? Generally, it's uh, something that occurs from birth, but we have seen cases of patients who did not have a Chiari malformation at birth and then developed one. Um, this is a little girl that I've actually known since she was, um, you know, inside her mother, about six months gestation. And this is her MRI at about one year of age. Everything is above the frame and magnum. And the other thing you notice is the back of her head is basically rounded, and there's nothing going down into her spine. Then she came back with a tethered spinal cord, and now she has her cerebellar tonsils going down well past C1. And the shape of her skull has even changed. It's indented and curved. And her fourth ventricle, which was open here, is now gone. So it can happen. Um, you really can't tell. You can tell by history if someone says that they didn't walk until they were two years old. They were never a good eater. They had apnea as a baby. They had terrible reflux. Then you know it probably was going on from birth. But most people don't have an MRI as an infant to go back and say whether they had it or not. So we really just guess by history. All of these conditions are associated with Chiari 1 malformation, seizures, autism, spectrum, cranial synostosis, uh, migraine headaches, pseudotumor, Ehlers-Danlos, connective tissue disorders, tethered spinal cord. We're not sure of the frequency of tethered spinal cord. We know that it's more than 20 percent. Um, and so hopefully our Chiari program will flesh that out as we're following all of our patients. Uh, clipophile, which is literally a fusion of cervical vertebrae in the neck, may just be a finding on x-ray or may be symptomatic and cause problems. And then, of course, myelomeningocele with Chiari too. Now, Chiari doesn't cause these problems. But when you think about what I've told you in terms of the skull not developing large enough and compression of the brain, then you can visualize how that cause can also lead to problems with seizures from pressure in the brain, pseudotumor cerebri, which is an abnormal buildup of fluid and pressure in the brain for an unknown reason, but usually related to problems with venous drainage. Um, 
And uh, migraine headaches, of course, you have, those are vascular headaches. So you have problems with blood flow and CSF absorption. Craniosynostosis is literally a fusion of the skull. Okay, so the skull is not, you know, expanding the way it should, and that involves the back of the head as well. Okay. So the surgery, the, the classic surgery that we do for Chiari malformation, once we determine that it's symptomatic, is a suboccipital craniectomy, which is removing the bone from the back of the skull, usually about to here. You know, this is variable. I don't do small openings personally. Um, because a lot of my kids are babies uh, or little kids and the bone can grow back. And I, I like to do it once. So I take a generous opening. There are many variations in how people do this. But the classic way is the suboccipital craniectomy, generous opening, a C1 laminectomy, which is removing about a one inch uh, length in the midline of the C1 vertebrae on the back, and then opening the dura which is duraplasty, and sewing in a big graft to give even more space. So what you're really doing is just opening up this space. And so this is a patient pre-op, and then this is a pa the same patient post-op. The uh, bone has been removed up to here. I always remove the tonsils as well, the cerebellar tonsils. They don't have any known function, and they can just, all they can do is go down and cause problems again, so I take them out. And the C1 lamina here was there, is now out. And we have lots of nice fluid around the um, spinal cord and brainstem. We also have opened up the fourth ventricle from the way it was. Okay. So at surgery, this is a patient with um, Chiari 1. The top of the head is up here. This is the cerebellum. The neck is down here. And these are the cerebellar tonsils. The dura is open. The bone's already been removed. You don't see the spinal cord at all. This is after decompression. Um, the tonsils have been removed. This is the white spinal cord underneath. And the fourth ventricle here is open, which was completely occluded by the tonsils before. This is the difference between a Chiari 1 malformation and Chiari 2 malformation. This is a patient with spina bifida, about a 20, um, about 30 actually, year old woman um, with headaches. Here, I can't open the dura widely the way I did the last one um, because of malformations of the venous sinuses. Uh, and we can't remove all of those structures that I told you were going down into the spine. I can decompress her uh, cerebellar tonsils here. I can open up her fourth ventricle and expose the spinal cord, but that's about what I can do there. So associated with uh, Chiari malformation, syringomyelia, um, essentially hydrocephalus of the spinal cord, as I mentioned, that may be um, communicating type, um, which is Chiari 2, which really is a variant of hydrocephalus globally. <laughs> In other words, sometimes when we see a patient with spina bifida who has a Chiari malformation and has a shunt malfunction, we see large ventricles, but we also see fluid throughout the spinal cord. And, you know, the question is, should we decompress the Chiari? A lot of the time, if we revise the shunt, which means to fix the shunt, replace the part that's plugged, all of the fluid goes away, including the fluid in the spine. Chiari 1 is non-communicating type. Um, but decompression of the Chiari a lot of the time does cause the syrinx to go away. And then we have to distinguish that from, you know, a tumor or something related to an old spinal cord injury. A lot of the time patients I'm sent um, have a fluid collection or a syrinx without a Chiari. And the question is, is there something on the MRI that we don't see, you know, what's causing it? A lot of the time, you know, the history reveals that this is a kid who's involved in, you know, travel sports, maybe two travel sports, a very aggressive hockey player, football player, you know, competitive cheerleader, um, sometimes lacrosse or soccer, but not as much. And there's been a cervical spine injury that accounts for that. So this is a little girl who had uh, come in um, essentially paralyzed on one side after just doing a handstand. And she'd always done gymnastics. They never knew she had a Chiari or anything. And she, her MRI showed this. She recovered movement uh, on that side over about three days. And we did her decompression. 
and here you see the tonsils removed, the bone is removed, and the syrinx has gone away. This was over about six weeks. Another interesting thing that I see, also the fourth ventricle is open, and you actually can see the tract in her between the uh, fourth ventricle and out into the subarachnoid space. The other thing that we see frequently when we decompress the Chiari and remove the tonsils and reestablish the flow, the whole brain actually rises up. So you can picture the cerebellum in her now is actually higher than it was. Because what we've done is we've opened up fluid flow, the pressure comes down, and there was brain swelling, which you can't obviously see on the pre-op scan, but it has come down and the whole brain has risen up. So other associated conditions with Chiari, hydrocephalus. Um, we treat hydrocephalus generally in Chiari with a shunt. Chiari is a combination of obstructive and communicating hydrocephalus. So you've probably heard of endoscopic third ventriculostomy um, or opening up a pathway uh, to drain the fluid in a different way without hardware. That doesn't work well in patients with Chiari because if there is scarring around the base of the skull, that's the space that you would drain the fluid to. So it really doesn't work. Um, I see about three or four patients a year uh, with Chiari malformation who end up needing a shunt as well. And um, that may be a shunt to the heart, ventriculoatrial shunt, or more commonly a shunt to the abdomen draining from the ventricle through a valve to control the fluid into the peritoneal cavity where it's absorbed. Sometimes we also do lumbar shunts. As you can imagine, if you already have the brain sinking into the spine, this is generally not the best option for patients with Chiari malformation. But if they've had a lot of problems with shunts in the head, sometimes we move to the spine. So a lot's been written about tether cord and its relation to Chiari malformation, um, that's a relatively new topic. Um, but we are appreciating that, you know, when all of the symptoms don't go away after Chiari decompression, if there's still back pain, pain in the legs, numbness and tingling in the feet, abnormal bowel and bladder function, there may also be a tethered cord and we get MRI to look for that. When we've seen tethering of the spinal cord with Chiari patients, it's subtle. It's not a big, huge you know, lipoma or tumor in the spinal canal. There's not a big bony spicule. It's not a split cord malformation. And usually the spinal cord is not low-lying. So I'm going to say 90% of the time the, the MRI is read as normal. But what we do see is thickening of the phylum, uh, which should not be more than two millimeters, and generally should be smaller than the nerve roots. When the phylum is fatty, thick, pulled dorsally, and much bigger than any of the nerve roots, and the person has symptoms, then we know that the patient has tethering. So this is an example of the subtle kind of tethered cord that I frequently see with Chiari. The spinal cord is not low-lying. It's supposed to end between T11 and L1, around L2 in babies. And in this patient, let's see, S154, L3, S1, L5, L4, L3, L2, L1. This is ending at L1. So it's not low-lying, but it's pulled dorsally within the spinal cord, uh, within the spinal canal. It's not following the contour of the spinal canal. It's more anterior or more towards the front at the top, more towards the back, lower down, as if it's being pulled. And then you see the fatty phylum here, which is this bright spot, which is fatter than any of the other roots and is infiltrated with fat. Just to compare normal versus abnormal, this is a young boy, uh, he was about 12 years old, who had seen me for back pain and it ended up being related to athletics. His spinal cord ends about L1 also, but is completely in the midline. Everything is, you know, the nerve roots are just draping down and you can see them coming down and there's nice fluid all the way around the spinal cord as opposed to that last patient who has this sort of pull. Looking at the axials, the normal patient, the phylum is there in the center of the um, canal at the level of the kidneys, which is L2, and the nerve roots are just breaking up and coming out around it, as opposed to this patient whose phylum is pulled towards the back and is large. 
So uh, treatment for tethered cord, once we establish that it is a tethered spinal cord, the only treatment is, you know, surgery. And so what we do is we identify the phylum, and here you can very well appreciate the fat in it, at the bottom of the spinal cord, separate all the nerve roots away from it, and then cut it. And that takes the tension off the spinal cord and allows the spinal cord to grow with the patient if the patient is a child. And if they're an adult, it just releases the spinal cord from uh, whatever it was adherent to that was causing the pain and the symptoms. Rarely, we've actually seen Chiari symptoms from a tether cord if the pull is strong enough because the, um, the MRI may not even show tonsillar herniation, but you have this constant yank on the neuroaxis, which translates all the way up to the brainstem. Okay. So, after everything I've told you and shown you that this is a real disease, a real disorder, a real problem, and has a real treatment, Sonia and I in Chiari Clinic have heard some real zingers about what patients have been told about Chiari. This one, you know, we've all heard. It's a normal variant, so it can't cause any symptoms. How can it be a cause of any problem? You're born with it. Why are you just now having symptoms? Why are we forced to defend why we started having symptoms? This is a question we don't know. And this is a question that research has to show us, but that doesn't mean the symptoms are not there. We should just watch it. What are we watching it do? That's what I always want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Your symptoms are psychiatric, depression, panic, anxiety. If it's a kid, he's just doing this to get attention. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I heard this one. When you're unable to walk, when you're in a wheelchair, then we'll do surgery. Surgery will make you worse. We wouldn't do surgery if it made people worse. You're doing all this to yourself. This is something that you're just causing, and you need to just stop doing it. My personal favorite, these are just girl problems. You want to laugh, but it, it's sad, because people are really suffering. And, you know, I'm sorry. I apologize for the medical profession. Uh, I apologize for people who didn't have the knowledge to address the problem and couldn't just say, I'm going to send you to someone else who knows. But that's why organizations like CSF are so important. Research uh, and continuous research, particularly with all of your cases and putting all your data together. That's why we ask you so many questions. That's why we, you know, ask questions going back to birth. I love it when your moms are with you, you know. Somebody is 40 years old and his mother's there with him and I can ask when he started walking and stuff like that. <laughs> because it all contributes to our knowledge that we can disseminate so that people aren't told these horrific things. Um, Conquer Chiari is another organization that contributes to awareness. So between research and awareness and trying to get the word out, everybody's not going to believe you. You know, it can be a little bit embarrassing. We all want to feel like, you know, we don't want to talk about our story or anything. But, you know, until we really get information out to both practitioners and colleagues and family and friends, then, you know, we won't make any progress. Beaumont has been very, very supportive of the Chiari program and in helping with outreach and resources, social media, um, on the um, news media, and um, uh, by supporting the uh, Chiari support group as well. And so we keep going and doing all of this for our patients, who are the real reason that we're all here, and my kids. <laughs> And that's what I have for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>